Um, thanks for all coming um, here to uh, hear me talk about kind of pattern and how it might relate to um, permaculture. Um, this has really um, come out of the fact that when I've been on permaculture courses and the subject of natural patterns come up, it's been one that I felt quite attracted to and quite interested in. It seems to be a kind of quite common passion. And you see all these different kinds of patterns and it's exciting. Um, but then I was sort of kind of like, oh, but I still, still haven't really kind of understood something about this. There's still something kind of missing about it for me. Um, so I tried to do a bit of my own sort of journey to try and kind of understand what kind of like natural um, pattern meant a bit. Um, and so really what I'm going to do today is talk about like where I'm at on that journey really. I won't say I've reached any kind of particular sort of destination but to kind of share with you um, some of that. Um, in uh, Bill Mollison's uh, Permaculture Designer's Manual he has a kind of chapter dedicated to pattern. So when I was thinking, oh, what is this thing about natural pattern and permaculture, I'll, I'll go to the source and look that up. And almost one of the first things that Bill Mollison says there is, this is a really important subject and I really didn't want to have to write about it. Um, which I think was kind of an awareness that um, it was so kind of such a big, potentially big subject in a way that it was quite hard to kind of kind of grasp about it. And to tell you the truth, like I still find like his chapter on pattern largely impenetrable. <laughs> so it, it didn't be didn't become a very useful source for me in um, in thinking about um, pattern and permaculture. Um, so I thought rather than be put off by this, I would try to try to find my own kind of way in there, find something that was kind of had, had resonance um, about it uh, for me. And at the beginning of that was this kind of question about like what actually are um, patterns. Um, what defines a kind of pattern and um, quickly realised that people were talking about kind of patterns in, in lots of different kinds of ways um, so I mean these are kind of patterns can, can anybody recognise what, what this costs? Yeah, what about that but these, we vote for. It's a bit baby down here, don't they? Yeah. yeah. Not doing too, not doing too bad here, but there was a general kind of like not so enthusiastic about answering as we were about the first. Yeah. And yet we have this part of our brain that kind of recognises um, loads of these sort of things. Um, in fact, kind of like pattern is kind of really built into our into our way of thinking. We're kind of pattern recognising, pattern making um, creatures. Um, and but now an awful lot of part of that part of our brain becomes kind of interested in this sort of um, stuff, and so that we can kind of recognise loads of these, and we look at. A lot of us can look at this and think, I don't really know what it is, but I'm looking at it. Plants, you know, flowers. Um, so this kind of poses me a question, like, what exactly is it that we're loving? Um, you know, thinking, you know, when we look at these kind of patterns and shapes out there. And so key to this, I think, is this idea of um, pattern literacy, about being kind of literate in kind of patterns, recognising and under understanding them. Um, and so, when I tried to find an inroad into this, something that kind of gave me some way of kind of grasping this, I came across um, a book by an American ecologist called Tyler Volk. He wrote this book called Meta Patterns. I thought, oh, that sounds really good. That sounds like it's got really going to have a kind of shit in it. Um, and its kind of subtitle is um, uh, something like of space, time, and mind. Oh. And, and this was quite a useful kind of way for me to start to kind of understand the different ways that people were talking about. Um, Patterns, the kind of the kind of spatial patterns, the temporal patterns, and also like mental and psychological patterns. Um, and any of you that are in Lumi McNamara's talk earlier today about kind of um, people care might have heard her talk about kind of how patterns of behaviour and kind of sort of bad habits and kind of or good habits. Um, and in fact, like all of our sense of pattern is really kind of coming from that mind, kind of deciphering it. Um, 
So um, Tyler Volt goes into all three of these categories. I don't really have time to do that um, today, so I'm going to concentrate just on the kind of spatial um, element um, of pattern, um, patterns in space. Um, but which I don't mean outer space, although that is a picture of outer space, I think of physical space, although we can see a, a spiral pattern in space um, there. And um, in, on permaculture courses, when, when patterns are talked about, it's often patterns like the spiral which kind of come up, sort of like the spiral branching patterns, lobes, networks. They kind of like sound kind of groovy, slightly psychedelic kind of thing, so exciting. Uh, in a way, I'm not going to talk about those patterns. <laughs> um, because uh, really, after reading Tyler Volk's book, I kind of realised that there actually are some more basic elements um, to pattern um, before those more exciting ones, and that I realised it was really useful to try and understand those before we try and understood those those other ones. Um, okay, so possibly the most common pattern or shape in the in the universe is, is spheres. What I'd like to do now here, now, is to kind of uh, hand out some kind of modelling clay. Not to you guys, you can uh, take a bit and, kind of, um, and pass it along. And uh, this, uh, for the purposes of this, is the sort of primordial, primordial stuff of the, of the universe. Um, and uh, start kind of uh, working that through in your in your hand to kind of get a sense of uh, the stuff of the universe. Um, the, that image on the on the screen here uh, is kind of a, uh, an attempt to kind of depict in that top left corner there the idea of the kind of the hydrogen atom. Now, when we talk about the shapes of, of atoms, we, we're getting into a kind of strange sort of um, area, possibly right into that, um, because it's difficult to actually kind of see. But the kind of the general kind of model of the atom, and actually sort of over here, these are kind of images of, of kind of atoms is the, the basically kind of sort of spherical shape and the hydrogen atom is the most basic of the atoms. And when we look out into space using our instruments, about somewhere 80% plus of what the observable mass of the universe is hydrogen, is kind of made of these quite basic spheres. Um, this is quite a big ball of hydrogen, I don't know if anyone recognises this one. <laughs> this is our sun, um, uh, 93 million miles away. But we've sort of moved from that kind of like micro kind of scale to the kind of like quite macro scale. We kind of see this kind of same shape um, that's sort of a, appearing there. And um, I think you might start to notice when you start kind of forming the primal mass of the, of the cosmos, that it does quite naturally kind of, uh, it's quite easy to make this, this shape. Um, um, in it. Um, so there's one, there's, there's home, um, kind of the blue marble. So we can't live on a sphere as well as kind of observing the spheres. Um, this is a, another blue marble. This is a kind of human um, egg cell. Uh, you see a few kind of sperm trying to make their, their inroads there. So both on the kind of sort of on the kind of physical, um, in the physical world and in the biological world, the kind of sphere um, appears quite a lot. Um, and these kind of patterns appear like both in the kind of the biophysical world, um, in the kind of the mineral world. We see it in both plants and in animals, in flora and fauna. And there's a kind of idea here of, um, in science, of convergence. These things aren't particular; they they're not related by um, very close genetics uh, or anything. They're not all in the same environments, but they are kind of finding the same sort of shape. Um, there's some more eggs there, frog spawn. These are slugs eggs. Find any decent mm -hmm. um, So there's some particular qualities um, of the sphere which make it uh, um, something um, that kind of life likes to likes to go um, towards. Um, I just want to note here as well that kind of when we talk about sphere, a lot of people kind of look at things and go, well, that isn't a sphere. It's a bit bumpy over here, isn't that more ovoid? You know, sort of like, this isn't, this isn't a sphere, it's a different kind of shape. But basically, there are, the idea of the sphere, the pure sphere related to pi, the irrational number, is like a mental construct. It basically doesn't exist in the universe outside that. The closest thing in, I've been able to discover to a perfect sphere is a stationary neutron star. 
which I think is a fairly theoretical kind of idea. So basically when we're talking about the kind of, we're talking about sphericity, we're talking about moving towards the qualities of a sphere. And there are two main qualities um, to a sphere. Um, for any given volume, it has the minimum surface area that that volume can have. Um, this means it kind of, um, what's inside has the least contact with the outside. Basically, that. You know, anybody think any reasons why that, that might be? Why might you want to to minimise your contact with the outside? Right. Protection. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. the outside world can be quite dangerous, and actually, one of the places we see the sphere quite a lot, as we can see here, is in young organisms. Um, so, like in kind of like eggs of all kinds. So we've got those like frog spawn, slug eggs. Kind of the shape. Um, you know, some some animals they are more spheroid than this, but you know, even you can see this is approaching kind of sphericity. Um, but you also get it in the kind of the young part, the, the reproductive parts of things. So when we look at fruit, we quite often, quite common see this this shape um, in a kind of plum there, in a kind of melon. Um, you can even see kind of like the mushroom, which is you know this is like the fruiting body of the of the mushroom, sort of moving towards sphericity. And you see it in flower buds, and you see it in leaf buds, because these are the, the young parts of the organism need the most protection. And so, by minimising the contact um, with the outside world, you allow it to kind of like enjoy part of its growth in the most protected form. Um, as um, so, that talking about that flower bud there, um, you see it kind of see a lot of seed shapes as well, pollen. This is actually pollen of um, another gardener's favourite, um, bindweed. Um, <laughs> uh, um, you see there, the apple, the kind of glob, globe artichoke, they're all kind of like sharing this sort of tendency towards sphericity. Um, we usually see in kind of like nest formations as well, offering a kind of like another form of protection. So there's like a wasp <laughs> there, and the uh, web of an orb spider. Now, as some um, organisms become more mature, they tend to lose their sphericity because that kind of protective aspect that they need um, becomes less important. Um, and the places where this is kind of is, um, in plant world, one place where this doesn't really happen is in kind of cacti. Um, cacti and kind of succulent plants tend to retain more of a kind of sphericity in their shape than, than other plants. Anybody think why that might be? Minimizes water loss. Yeah, minimizes water loss. They're in a particular kind of environment. Um, this kind of dry environment. They kind of they, they want to protect themselves from evaporation. So, um, so unlike plants in other environments, um, they kind of maintaining more of this kind of shape. Um, so, in, uh, in adults, we still kind of we have a, a <laughs> parts of our body which need the most protection tend to be have the more kind of sphericity. And there's another aspect of the, um, the sphere is that it's, it's the strongest structure for the least material. Um, so you've got a limited amount of material, the strongest structure you can make from that is a sphere. Um, and so it has this kind of like structural properties of kind of um, um, resistance to the outside and of kind of providing a kind of structure. And so in the parts of the human body that we require kind of like um, more protection, like the brain, so you can see here. Um, this is my left retina, the eye, another kind of sort of little thing. Um, if I should look away now, I'd be not too happy with the human body because there are other parts of the human body that <laughs> are sensitive and benefit from the protection of the spherical shape. Um, this is not me, this is from Wikipedia, um, where it's, uh, uh, I think, photographer, uh, I think copyright is a photographer's own, so I think bravo, that man there, um, contributing to the world's knowledge on Wikipedia. So we're all kind of aware of these parts of the body that are, that are kind of the more sensitive kind of stuff, and they kind of they're, they're using that kind of like least amount of surface area kind of like protecting it inside there. Um, again, we see it on the micro kind of scale, it's kind of a, an immune cell in our blood, and some things will don't necessarily have the spherical shape, but will assume it. So you know, kind of like the kind of hedgehog where it kind of rolls itself in, or in this case, a woodlouse. Um, so often we kind of see an aspect of the spherical um, quality uh, in things. Um, 
And the kind of the dome, which is kind of almost like sort of half of half of this, um, and we squeeze this against a kind of flat surface. That kind of dome, if you've got a flat surface to build on, the dome becomes the strongest material for the least surface rather than the sphere, but you're actually using something that's there already. So this is kind of it's a way of kind of minimizing the amount of material that you want to use for structural properties. So it's very energy efficient. The sphere and the dome are both energy efficient things. And nature is always trying to move towards kind of like the most efficient way of doing things. So we see it in the kind of bug, shape of the bug, ladybird. We see it in the kind of protective shell here, of the kind of tortoise, or we see it in the kind of turtle and the other kind of things like that. We see it in the kind of nut form as well, kind of like sort of pistachio, walnuts here. Um, and humans have used this kind of shape as well. Um, so a couple of kind of famous buildings here, the Green Mosque in Istanbul and the uh, uh, Mosque and the Temple of the Mount in Jerusalem. Um, and it represents something that I'm not really going to go into here about the kind of, some of the kind of cultural um, elements of some of these kind of shapes. The kind of, especially the, the, the circle and the sphere, they have this kind of common reappearance in kind of spiritual traditions. And they kind of, the idea of the kind of vault of heaven. Um, and that's why they often appear in these kind of spiritual kind of buildings. But they're kind of real, they have this massive kind of ability to contain space with the least amount of material, which is why kind of builders are like them. And you often, people talk about the kind of arch, the strength of the arch, but the dome is almost like it's like an arch, and then you move it through dimensions like that. So you imagine an arch, and you keep building it around, like that, you've kind of got this sort of dome shape, you've got amazing structural properties. Um, so here's a kind of dome closer to home for us, the dome of um, um, St. Paul's Cathedral um, during the Occupy movement. Down here you can see dome tents, which is quite a kind of common tent formation. Um, so kind of, and it's using the same kind of um, principle, kind of minimal material, large area covered, it's quite a nice space, and then you get quite a good tent in the dome tent. Graham will recognise that. Graham's <laughs> 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 So we kind of see these in kind of very different places. Um, and this kind of goes back quite a long way in human culture. Um, this is in a museum in Kiev in the Ukraine. Um, this is a kind of dome structure um, which is about 12,000 years old, um, which was found in um, the Ukraine using kind of mammoth tusks, tusks and bones. They're kind of using the kind of natural curves in the kind of structure of that kind of animal in order to, uh, to benefit from that dome structure for so the kind of capacity they're using, the kind of structural properties, and they've got that large living space in there. And I recently read there's been some archaeological discoveries of um, Neanderthal um, settlements that seem to using a similar structure to this, that may be like 20,000 years old, so sort of um, pretty early in kind of um, in, in homo culture. Um, this is a kind of bender, which some of you may know, a sort of quite traditional structure, probably kind of early humans, um, quite difficult to get the amount of mammoth bones and tusks together to build something out of uh, mammoth tusks, but quite easy <coughs> to get enough kind of wood, put it in the ground, bend it over, tie it to another piece, create a dome structure like that, cover it with animal hide or brash or something, and there's probably many of the early human structures were using this kind of dome thing. Which I think is quite a reminder that, like you know, we're not separate from nature. We are a part of nature. We engage in all of these same sort of techniques. Okay, so the, the next kind of, of total box meta pattern that I talk about is the kind of sheet. So basically, we've got this. We've got our kind of like balls or whatever here. If, we, if you've still got one of these, if you kind of like squash this down, try to flatten this out here, kind of uh, stretch it out. See so kind of see how how big a flat thing you can get here. This is all basically. We're moving from the ball, so we're now taking the cosmic stuff, the universe. We're moving from that ball, that spherical shape, into a sheet form. And the sheet form, in some ways, is kind of the opposite of the spherical form. So with the spherical form, we were trying to minimise the surface area to the volume. With the kind of sheet form here, we're doing the opposite, we're kind of maximising that. We're trying to kind of get more surface area. And we often see this in nature, um, where it's trying to create a transfer medium, where you want to transfer energy or material 
So the classic form of this, of course, is the, is the leaf. Um, there's a set of transfers happening in a leaf. Anybody know any <coughs> things that are happening on a leaf? Okay. Photosynthesis, yeah. So having a kind of big leaf there is creating a larger area for sunlight to hit, more photons are hitting, allowing more photosynthesis to happen. So for, in the leaf form, it wants, it wants to kind of like maximize this surface area. Um, but also some other things are being transferred across this surface. Transpiration. Transpiration, yes. Yeah, so we've got, um, there's a couple of things there. So we've got um, the movement of kind of gases. So generally on the underside of the leaf, we've got kind of this relationship with the atmosphere with kind of carbon dioxide moving in. And then we also get kind of like water moving up through the plant, coming there. Um, so other kind of sheet form is the, is the wing. And this is also doing a transfer. It's kind of, it's a sort of transfer of, of energy. Um, and it's using, it, again, you want this kind of large surface area to kind of move this kind of air around to kind of create the lift. It's kind of, kind of the kinetic energy from, you know, from the biological processes of digestion and so It gets kind of lift up into the air. Um, obviously it comes in, it's in a range of different animals, not just birds. Insects. We also see this kind of this sort of sheet form. Um, we often don't see it, but it's kind of there in kind of fluids in the atmosphere and in uh, in water. So you know, some of you may have that experience of when you're kind of swimming, um, where you sort of dive down and you kind of you come into a bit of water, which is a different temperature, but you get these sort of different kind of sheets um, of, of um, water. And you also get this in the atmosphere. Sometimes we see this kind of sheet formation. It's basically this is the this is the point at which um, water vapor is um, starting to come into that cloud form. The temperature drops and it kind of like becomes into droplets um, from gas. So it's another place we see the sheet form. But like the kind of bird's wing, obviously like the opposite of the bird wing, where the, where the, where the bird or the insect wing is kind of that transfer medium of the of that energy kind of being used to move the air around. Um, humans have got quite good at reversing that process, taking movement in the air and turning that into kinetic energy to use. Um, so obviously we've kind of seen that in transportation um, in, in like ships where the kind of sail becomes a way of capturing that energy using the sheet form to kind of transfer it into a, into a movement forward. And in uh, wind turbine, um, a windmill in this case, but also in a kind of electric generating windmill, also in a kind of hydroelectric kind of rotor. Um, you can kind of see how it's kind of capturing that energy using a kind of sheet to kind of like, okay, I'm going to get in the way of this and transfer that kind of energy. Okay, so the third and kind of last um, form of tidal of volts that I talk about is kind of tubes or, or cylinders. So let's talk about our sheet here. It's almost like we can imagine we start to roll this, this over. You get a form that's sort of maybe like that or something. Um, and this has got some properties of the, sh of the sheet and some properties of the, of the sphere. Um, it's got a smaller surface area than the sphere, uh, but it's not containing as much volume. It's got a smaller surface area than the sheet, but it's not containing um, as much volume um, as the sphere. Um, and the, the tube is often, if the, if the sheet was about kind of like. Um, Sort of transfer of energy. So the tube tends to be about kind of transportation. So you know, the classic form of this is in a kind of like a, in a sort of tree trunk um, that we see. And there's sort of transportation happening within that. If we know what sort of things are being transported. Water. Yeah, water. Yeah, sort of nutrients. And so we kind of see this shape kind of replicate in the roots and in the branches. Um, and so it's kind of like it's transferring kind of material. Kind of back and forth through here. And it also has some particular kind of properties in terms of its sort of surface um, area. That, uh, if we look at it like this, it has particular qualities. But if we look at it like this, it has a different kind of quality. So it's got a different amount of surface area here than here. And this is quite good if you want to move through a kind of medium that's resisting you. So when roots, like of a, of a plant or like mycelium of kind of fungi, they, they tend to have this kind of shape. So as they're moving through, if you want to move through the soil, if you want to try and move this through soil, it's quite energetic to try and do that. You've got quite a lot of resistance. But to move like this through soil, 
is a lot easier. So you're kind of carrying all this material kind of through and kind of using less energy. And so we also see this shape in a lot of forms of. Um, uh, so we see in kind of like snakes and worms kind of, and in the animal world that do the same sort of thing. Um, that's a mycelium there, trunk of a tree, grasses, worms. We also see this in some of our forms of transportation that where, I don't know, can you think of any things we used to move around in that like have more of this kind of shape? <coughs> trains. trains, yeah, especially tube trains. Um, yeah, so I mean trains in general, so they've got the smaller surface area, so the mat's been pushed through. Also like um, a plane, it has these kind of, it's using the sheet form in, in terms of the wings, but if you look at the fuselage, where most of the kind of mass of the material is, it's kind of using a small um, surface area at the start there. So one of the other main things that kind of the, the chief form transport is kind of stresses. So it's quite a good way of kind of like movement, kind of moving, kind of um, distributing kind of weight through. So what, one of the other things that the kind of the tree trunk is doing is it's kind of um, it's like holding that kind of whole mass of the tree by moving the kind of energy downwards. And so we also have that in our human skeletons when we're kind of distributing the kind of weight down. What's kind of really um, interesting I think with um, this is when we start to think about putting these things to, together. So I don't know if um, some of you make some balls, some of you make some sheets, and some of you make some tubes. You can kind of self-manage that to you. Who's making tubes? I'm making tubes. Anybody else making tubes? I've got a tube. Okay, we've got some tube makers. Have we got any, we got, we got any sphere makers? Sphere makers. Okay, we'll look at that. How about, how about sheet makers? Have we got any sheet makers? Okay, we've got a few. So what we kind of find, um, we might want to start, actually if you can start grouping together, if you can see someone's making a different shape to you, kind of gravitate towards them and kind of get your shapes together. Okay, if you haven't got any clay you'd like some, I've got, got some more here. Or if you just if you don't want to do that, kind of try and find some people that are and kind of see what, what we've got. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so has everybody, has everybody kind of can see somewhere where there's a tube, a sheet, and a sphere? Okay, so, so do you want some, do you want some things that look like this? Does this look, kind of look like what you what you might go? So can anybody else think of anything else that might look like this? Snail. Yeah. Apple tree. Apple tree. Apple tree. Apple tree. Yeah. That's more what I was saying for snails. It does look a bit like a snail. <laughs> <laughs> but when you kind of see, when you kind of see an apple tree or kind of, kind of fruit trees, what you look, you're seeing a range of different shapes, a range of different patterns. All of it has the same DNA. It has the same genetics, but kind of manifest in different kind of ways. So we can see in a kind of in an apple tree, say, or another kind of fruit form, we've got this kind of tube form, um, providing the kind of basic structure, the kind of the, the branches, the kind of stem. We've also got the kind of sheet form of the um, of the leaf, and we also have the kind of spherical form in the kind of fruit, or we also see it in the leaf bud or in the flower bud. 
So what we can see here is that kind of nature is kind of like manifesting these different patterns for different design purposes. Because it, 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 there are different design needs that kind of nature kind of has. It needs this needs this kind of structure to kind of reach out. It needs this kind of structure to to transfer, to kind of absorb the sunlight, to transfer kind of water and carbon dioxide. And then this is this kind of reproductive kind of future. And it wants to really wants to look after this. Wants to kind of protect this as much as it can. So it's using these different kind of shapes. And so, what I just sort of would invite you to do now is to start to to look for these shapes um, out in nature yourself um, as you go around, um, and you can start to see that the kind of the more complicated shapes that we might have spoken about, um, sort of spirals, it's not my phone, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the branching and and spirals are actually kind of start to, are constructed of these elements. A lot of their properties are are relationships. That, uh, about achieving these kind of um, these kind of properties, um, and the key um, thing that for me that Bill Mollison kind of said in his uh, sorry about that um, in, in his chapter, one thing I did get from it is that there are two important things about um, pattern. Um, one is recognizing um, the patterns that are within nature, and the other one is about kind of using. Um, pattern to achieve um, achieve our ends, and so I think what this means is there's both the kind of pattern literacy, which is what we've been working with here about kind of, sort of recognizing and understanding patterns, and then there's kind of writing or expressing ourselves in a pattern language. Um, but it's only really you can't really write in a language until you can read it, um, and I think this is kind of that that key thing about about in permaculture about observation and about starting to. I think what kind of pattern is, is about, it's about the next stage of observation. It's about kind of, okay, I'm looking, I'm seeing these things, and then kind of, oh, I'm seeing these things again and again. And, I'm, and that must be for a reason. So what might those reasons be? And it's from our observations and recognizing patterns that we start to draw the kind of principles out of like how we understand kind of nature. And I think that's where we might move from to start kind of expressing ourselves or writing in, in a pattern language, kind of understanding the kind of the, the particular kind of energy efficiencies and needs that kind of nature is kind of um, trying to meet in the shapes um, that it's using. So I don't really have any more to say about it. As I said at the start, this is kind of where I'm at in my kind of development of kind of thinking about this. And I'm, I am absolutely certain there is a, a lot more um, to know about it, and, uh, but I think the, the more of us that are kind of thinking about these things and, and uh, looking at, at how we might use these things, we might get a more kind of sophisticated kind of um, understanding of, of how nature works and be able to use that in in our designs um, for our our own systems. Um, yeah, so that I'm done. If you have any particular questions, I will I will try I will do my best to um, to try and answer. And uh, if you have any of my Play-Doh. Um, I invite you to smell it now to use your olfactory sense to try and embed the knowledge. <laughs> and then if you bring it back here, and I'll point it out. But if, if anyone has any questions, I'll, I'll happily try and try and ask. Yes. Um, I, I personally um, don't. I mean, it, pattern is a subject which is fascinating to to many people. There are many different angles on it. So, there, I mean, if you start searching on on YouTube and other things, you can find um, plenty of video on it. I mean, there are, I think there are a number of different angles, and some of which um, you, a bit like a rabbit hole. There's a whole idea of kind of sacred geometry, the kind of idea that there are kind of like particular kind of shapes um, in the universe. Well, there's a book about it there. Um, and there's a certain kind of there's a cosmic importance to this, and um, and that we actually kind of understand some of the design of the universe by looking at that. And there are things like the Fibonacci sequence or the kind of gold section repeating sort of numerical forms um, over. Um, but yeah, I mean it's uh, it's uh, it's a really big it's a really big subject. <laughs> um, but also, I mean, some people look at that not from a spiritual perspective, but um, there's a very interesting one actually in terms of videos um, called V Heart. V, v is V-I, heart is like a stag, H-A-R-T, 
and um, she's a mathematician and she's done some videos about um, Fibonacci sequence um, and uh, these sort of number patterns which represent which then represent themselves in terms of shape. Um, so I really recommend that. Uh,